Welcome back. As you can see, it is just me here to do a quick introduction. Um, earlier this weekend, I had the opportunity to present at a international conference. Uh, it's the International Conference uh, for Psychology, Counseling and Education, ICPCE. Uh, Dr. Marshall and I have presented at the, this conference um, a couple of years ago. Um, and this year it was virtual. And because it was virtual, I had the chance to record it. Um, and I was uh, got the permission to present it uh, for the podcast this week. So um, for those of you who are listening to this as a podcast, just an audio podcast, uh, please know that I'm going to be referring to uh, slides uh, in the presentation, uh, in the talk. Um, if you go on to our YouTube channel, you'll be able to see the presentation with the slides and everything. Um, the what comes with this is, of course, this is a virtual conference, and so you're going to hear uh, some clicking and some different things, uh, but hopefully everything will come through nice and clean for you um, to, to hear and, um, you know, just giving you some things to think about. Um, it also ends a little bit abruptly because of the way that there's some transitions that happen. So, uh, but the topic of the talk is on teachers who have a history of trauma. And, you know, we talk a lot about adverse childhood experiences and what that means for students and how we need to think about trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive schools. Um, but very little attention has been paid to, uh, you know, what happens in the event that a teacher has a history uh, of trauma that might um, influence his or her uh, opportunities to provide that, um, you know, that consistent, that um, very regulated environment that students uh, need to be able to learn and, and, and foster and grow. So um, th that's the nature of the talk. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, we look forward to hearing anything from anyone who has any questions or thoughts or comments about this. Um, it is an area that is not very well researched so far. And um, hopefully, hopefully that will change soon. Hopefully more people will start to research it. So enjoy the podcast. So in, in addition to um, some of my clinical work, uh, over the last couple of years, I've been working in the school system as well. And um, through that work, uh, it has really led to um, a, a lot of interest that I've had in resilience, uh, which so, so it's fantastic that this is the, the topic of, um, or the main focus of this uh, conference this year. And so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share my screen now, um, I think. And um, so that we can, I can show you um, what, what I'm going to talk about today is the idea of um, resilience, but primarily resilience from the perspective uh, of teachers. Um, and in this talk, um, I'm going to cover and, and, and kind of review um, ACEs, um, what ACEs does to the brain. Um, and, and then sort of where things have evolved since, um, since ACEs and um, since we've really learned um, as much as we have about ACEs. So, um, okay, so, um, so yes, we're gonna talk about um, ACEs, ACEs and what it does to the brain and then get into how ACEs have informed uh, classrooms and um, an area that I think is, is really important that we haven't considered as much, and that is um, how ACEs affect other people in the school. Um, most of you are probably aware uh, of ACEs, but ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And um, back in the mid 90s, uh, Kaiser uh, and, and the Centers for Disease Control here in the United States started a study um, that looked at uh, the long-term effects of early childhood experiences. And what this, um, what it has done and what has happened over the, 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 the subsequent, you know, decades is that there, there has been a, a, a huge amount of research done to look at what happens to individuals, what is happening to individuals as the uh, as some of these adverse experiences happen, um, but what happens, especially what happens to them, happens long term. There are in the original um, ACEs studies, there were ten primary uh, ten primary uh, events or uh, experiences noted. 
Um, three of them were pretty directly towards the child. So you see the abuse, the physical abuse, emotional abuse, or sexual abuse. Um, two are directed towards the child, but sort of indirect, and that's neglect. So you have physical and emotional neglect. And then the third uh, group are the five remaining that are not directly towards the child, but certainly within the, the, the setting of the child or within the environment of the child. So that's if there's a family member with mental illness, um, if a parent especially has been incarcerated, um, domestic violence, especially domestic violence towards the mother, um, anyone with, with substance abuse in the, um, in the home, um, again, primarily parents, um, and then uh, divorce. Um, so we have the, the five that are pretty much towards the, the child specifically, and then the five that are sort of household dysfunction. And you know, the, the research has primarily been conducted here in the United States, um, though other countries are, are, are looking at it as well. And we see that in the United States, at least about 61% of the population has at least one uh, uh, ACE score. So the way that they kind of did that is they created this questionnaire that has those 10 items, those 10 experiences on it, and they asked the person if they, you know, sort of a yes or no, did, did you experience this as a child or, or not? Um, and about 61% of the population here in the United States um, had at least one. Um, more concerningly, probably, is that about 16% um, experienced four or more. And, and um, in the UK, it's a little bit different. Um, it's about one in 10. So it's about 10% or so that experienced four or more. Uh, but it's still a large portion of the population. And, and when we think about what, why that's important is that as the number of ACEs increases, as your ACE score increases, long-term consequences of that increases. So as you can see in this um, sort of summary, um, if a person has zero ACEs, the, the prevalence of, let's say, heart disease is, is one in 14. Uh, but if they're, the person has between one or three, one in three ACE um, uh, on their ACE score, the prevalence of or the risk of heart disease is one in seven. And if you have four or more, it's one in six. So um, the, the, the significance of physical health concerns significantly increases. And, but if you look at that last line, you can see that the risk of mental health concerns significantly increases as well, where with no ACEs, the um, one in 96 would attempt suicide. But if you have four or more, the risk goes up to one in five. So the, the, there's a lot of concern as it relates to what happens when a person's uh, ACE score increases. And the, um, you know, the, the idea is that uh, you know, certainly we want to try to prevent or, or decrease the risk of, of uh, ACE scores, but, um, but we have to figure out how to do that. We, we have a lot of research that, that's happening to look at that. Now, one thing, uh, a couple of things that I will point out uh, about this research is it's all, um, per, for the most part, it's all been retrospective. So what I mean by that is they've had adults and they've asked adults, you know, what happened when they were children um, to determine how many ACEs that they have. And then they look at what they, what's going on with them as an adult. And so, um, you know, there's always that concern about, um, you know, what was abuse what one person may consider abuse, another person may not consider abuse. So there's a lot of um, subjectivity with some of that. Um, now they can look at DCF records or you, you know uh, child protective services records and things like that to see if a child was abused or, or removed uh, from the home or something. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of this research was just asking a person if this happened uh, back when they were a child, and then they look at how they were, how they are now. So there's those kinds of limitations with it. Um, the, um, the other kinds of, of concerns is that um, it, it's really just correlational. Um, and, and so it's not causal. The having a high A score doesn't mean that you're automatically going to have negative uh, outcomes as an adult. It's, there's this idea of resilience 
that is uh, that plays a heavy role in what eventually happens to a person. And so, um, oh, let me go back. So, um, you know, when we think about resilience, we think about um, how the person can cope with stress. And so, um, we're going to be getting into in just a moment. We're going to be getting into the idea of, of trauma, and when it comes to trauma, we're talking about a person's a person sort of becoming hypersensitive to uh, events that's going on around them. Um, and, and that's one of the, the main concerns as a person um, has experienced trauma, and then they end up um, becoming hypersensitive to the point that they, um, that they maybe respond at times when, they, when there's not really a threat, but their body or brain perceives that there's a threat, and so that they respond in a, a panic. Um, and you know, that kind of gets us into the realm of like PTSD and some of those kinds of um, concerns. Um, but resilience is this idea that the body is able to build up a, a resistance to that sensitization um, so, such that the person is able to cope with it and is able to, to respond to those events without much of a, um, without a significant of a problem. And so we hope to build resilience uh, while at the same time minimizing uh, trauma. Uh, but again, when we look at this, what the ACEs research has told us so far, um, it's all been retrospective. It's all been correlational. Um, as far as I have seen so far, that there hasn't been any pr uh, prospective studies that have said, you know, let's look at these kids and see what happens to them um, in the future simply because there hasn't been enough time. Uh, the, the first studies came out in the mid, mid to late 90s. And so, um, you know, even those kids that were, you know, young then, you know, they're still relatively young adults. And so we really haven't got to a point where we can follow them um, over long term. Now, this is a, um, an image that I, I, in the next couple of slides, have images that I've borrowed from um, a, a book called What Happened to You. It's a, it's a fantastic book. Um, by Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey, uh, where they talk about the effects of trauma and uh, what kind of influence it has on a person's overall development and, and especially their social emotional development. And, and some important things that we think about with the brain is that the brain develops and, and sort of functions from the bottom up. And so for those of you who've had uh, some, a little bit of neuroanatomy, you know that you know at the base of the brain is the brain stem and that sort of for the most part keeps us alive it it, it regulates our temperature it helps us breathe it, it keeps our heart beating and all of that and then as we move up we get into uh, more and more complex uh, functions like in the diencephalon we have arousal and sleep and eating and movement and those kinds of things and then the limbic system which is going to be really important uh, for what we're talking about is memory and emotions, especially. And then, but it's not until we get to the cortex that that nice uh, few, like five millimeter thick, uh, wrinkly part of our brain that really gets to be who we are as far as our uh, thinking and creativity and language and all of that stuff. That's all um, at the very top. Um, but the reason that this is important is as we talk about. Um, experiencing things around us, our brain again experiences those things from the bottom up. And so all of the information from our senses comes in through our brainstem and, and it, it, it has to flow up and through the rest of the areas of the brain before it gets to the cortex. And so um, let's think for a minute about a situation um, that maybe many of us have uh, experienced. And that is, you know, you're walking around outside or you're, you're doing something and for some reason you get very frightened. Um, you hear something in the bushes, you think you see something on the ground, you think you hear something behind you and you, um, you, that information comes into your senses and you panic for, for a moment. Um, that information really only made it to uh, this little area here um, where it says neuroendocrine here in the diencephalon uh, next to the, um, this little center part right here for the HPA axis, which is the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It's fun to say, uh, but what the HPA axis does is it puts and signals uh, fight or flight. 
But the reason I'm pointing this out is that as you can see, as the information comes in, it does not get to our cortex before our body reacts. And so it, and that is important, of course, because that's how we survive. That's how we, we make it through uh, those kinds of dangerous situations. It is far better from a survival perspective to um, you know, run away if you hear something in the bushes next to you than it is to wait and see if it's really a bear um, or, or a squirrel. You know, you, your body is going to tell you, let's get away first, and then we can look back and figure it out. Um, so it doesn't, none of that information even gets to our cortex before our body starts to respond. Um, and so what happens is when we experience trauma, um, that system becomes hyper, um, hypersensitive. And so that neuroendocrine and, and that area there in that diencephalon, um, this, this little area here um, in that second stage, begins to respond to events in our environment before our cortex gets the information, before we really understand what's going on. And many times we don't even have an explanation for what's happening. And so as you can see here, what, what happens is um, when our brain becomes dysregulated and, and neuroregulation, emotional regulation is, is such an important component of, well, of everything. Um, because what we want to do is we want to keep our brain regulated. We want to keep and maintain access to everything. So if you look at the, the, the upside down triangle on the right hand side, you can see that when, when our brain is regulated, when we're under control of everything, um, we have access that there's flow all the way up to the top and we have lots of access to our cortex. So we can access memories, we can access thoughts and ideas and we can really contemplate things. But there on the left-hand side, you can see that when we're dysregulated, there's much more energy in that diencephalon area, again, that fight or flight area, where we're really trying to be safe. We're not really thinking all that much. We're trying to be safe. And what that, um, that, that difference is pretty significant, of course, as you can imagine, because when we don't have access, that full access to our cortex, you know, we can't make decisions, we can't really think about things. And more importantly, um, as it relates to school, especially, we can't learn. And when we can't learn, um, then we get into all kinds of other problems and other issues uh, that we present um, in that in that type of setting. And so we need to, uh, we need to really work hard to remain regulated to to keep control of those areas of our brain. And, um, keep that diencephalon, that, that whole little, those bottom areas as calm as possible. Now, what ACEs has done um, as we kind of have evolved through this from the, from the inception of those ACEs, uh, the idea of ACEs up to, you know, some of that uh, brain stuff that I was just talking about, much of that has led to this idea of trauma-informed schools. Um, and you can find all kinds of things. You can find trauma-informed teaching, trauma-informed classrooms, trauma-informed schools, and there are lots and lots of different ideas about uh, what this is and how to do it. And it, you know, it just a, a Google search it will take you to lots of different um, lots of different options. But for the most part, they all include this type of um, system. And so what we're looking at for trauma-informed schools is the idea of social emotional learning. Um, and, and there are uh, you know, too many to count um, programs and systems and things like that that are, that are available to help schools focus on social emotional learning. Um, there, there are a few that have really taken off and are really becoming popular, um, but again, for the most part, they all kind of focus on these, um, these five core ideas. So we want to teach kids uh, how to manage their emotions. Um, so we have that self-management. We kind of go around and clockwise there. But we want to teach students how to um, manage their emotions. Um, but to be able to do that, of course, they have to be aware of their emotions. And one of the things we talk about you know, on the on the Psych Edge podcast, we, we've had multiple um, podcasts where we focused on emotions and talked about 
adequately and appropriately and correctly identifying emotions. Um, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, I, you know, I'm also working in the schools now. And in working in the schools, I have the opportunity to work very closely with students and parents and teachers. And, um, you know, I, I can't even tell you how many times a week I have discussions, um, especially in my elementary schools, primary schools, about the idea of teaching kids how to recognize their own emotions. Um, and, and this is especially the case with boys. Uh, boys, you know, for the most part, are taught that you can have a, two emotions. You can be angry or you can be happy. That's about it. Um, that boys aren't necessarily allowed to be sad. They're not allowed to, to um, worry and those kinds of things because they are often taught from an early age that they just that's not something for them to do. They, they need to get over it. They need to you know, just move on. Um, so teaching kids to be aware of what their emotions are to correctly identify and label them so that then they can manage them. And all of that, of course, goes into making good decisions. Um, and, and when we can control and manage and identify those emotions, it usually um, helps lead to appropriate relationship skills, knowing how to interact with each other, um, knowing how to engage with um, our peers. Um, and as we will kind of discuss moving ahead, um, you know, one of the most important things that happens in schools is the fostering and development of the relationship between the teacher and the students. Um, you know, research has really demonstrated the importance of a good teacher-student relationship so that the student knows and can trust the teacher and um, is aware that uh, he or she is there to support them and is going to be there to help them. Um, and then, of course, this leads to good social awareness. Um, you know, those first three years of school, if the student doesn't arrive at school um, in that very first grade, um, socialize, those first three years are, are critical to socialization. Um, you know, again, research has kind of shown that if a child is not properly socialized within the first three or four years of school, by the time they're about eight years old, um, th there's a lot of concern as it relates to their the, the possibility of them becoming even becoming socialized. Um, so we, we need to really work hard for that social awareness. And so together, these five or some iteration of these five are, are present in just about every um, program or system to, that focuses on social emotional learning. And, and this is what ACES has contributed to what we're doing in the schools and how we should be managing students um, in that school setting. Um, so um, what we want to do is we want to create safe, predictable, and secure environments. Um, when we think about the, uh, the difference between events that lead to trauma and events that lead to resilience, for example, um, those things that lead to trauma are those things that are, um, are, are severe, um, you know, high intensity, they're unpredictable, and, um, and, and they are, you know, chronic, they happen over uh, and pervasive, they happen over a long period of time. If we want things, if we want to build resilience, we look at things that create stress, but that are mild and moderate, um, not real severe stress, um, that they are predictable, the student knows when they're going to happen. And, and then they are, um, you know, they're, they're sort of short term, they're incontrollable, they're, they're not you know, they don't just happen anytime and in anywhere. Um, and so what that leads to and what that suggests for schools is that we create this safe, predictable and secure environment where the student's day is manageable and predictable. They know what comes next and, um, and they know that this, the, the school is safe. And, um, and, and so with that, then the student can then recognize and appropriately respond to situations. And we, sometimes we need to directly teach this. Um, and we teach that by, you know, by demonstrating and by doing um, direct instruction. So this is how we go to recess, or this is how we walk to the lunchroom. Um, and we, we create these situations so that the student can practice appropriate responses and, and recognize when they can behave this way or when they can do this or when this other situation may happen. Um, they can predict it and anticipate it. 
And, and what we've tried to do with these trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive schools is nurture healthy relationships. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, we really want to uh, highlight this idea of forming strong teacher-student relationships. Um, there, there, there is no doubt, any of you who, who work in the schools know that when the teacher and the student have a good relationship, when they, when they can um, communicate effectively with one another, when the student knows that the teacher is there to support him or her, and when the teacher is, uh, knows that the student is, is giving his or her best, um, that type of relationship is, is really critical to healthy, uh, a healthy environment. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the student is able, you know, that it has to be the teacher's pet or anything like that. It just means that the student is aware that, um, that the teacher cares about him uh, and it cares about his well-being and, and how well he's doing and cares about his future. Um, and then the last piece that's, that's really critical, again, is preventing dysregulation. As we saw in the slide a moment ago, when, when, when we become dysregulated, we lose access to those important cortical regions of our brain uh, to the point that we, um, you know, that we um, don't have access to learning, don't have access to our memories, don't have access to really those thinking centers of our brain. Um, all of which are, are critical for, um, for the educational uh, setting. So to date, our, the primary focus, and if you, if you do, um, I, I've really tried to figure out um, good keyword searches for, for uh, databases and things like that, uh, to look at trauma-informed schools and, and what we're really focusing on with trauma-informed schools. And the focus has primarily been on students. Um, how do we do this for students? And, and that makes sense. Um, and we, we certainly shouldn't back off of that. However, what if the teacher has a history of ACEs? Um, again, when we saw the, 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 the statistics earlier, about 61% of, of people have at least one um, and about 16% had four or more. Um, at least here in the United States. Um, the, the statistics are a little bit different in other countries, but it's all about the same. So what if the teacher has ACEs? And we know because these, these studies have all been retrospective, we know that these, the, these long-term effects are affecting adults. Um, and these are adults from all walks of life, whether they're physicians or they're teachers or you know, they're clerks at the store, um, it affects everyone. And so if a teacher has a history of ACEs, you know, what do we do in those situations? Because there are lots of, lots of things that happen in a school day that can affect um, a teacher and, and, and create some dysregulation um, in, in, in the teacher's neurobiology. Um, here in the States, at least, I'm not sure how, how often this happens in other places, but here in the States, we, we have drills once a month or so uh, the school has to practice all of these different types of drills. And so they have fire drills, they have natural disaster drills, they have lockdown drills. Um, you know, the United States is un unfortunately uh, known for uh, some, a, a lot of mass violence in the school setting. And so for those reasons, we have these lockdown drills. And through working in the schools, I, I see uh, these drills um, frequently. Uh, I actually cover three different schools, two elementary schools and a middle school. And so I see them at different levels. And you can tell the, the influence that some of these drills have, certainly on the students, but even on some of the teachers. Um, you know, when you're thinking about a lockdown drill, what you're talking about is you're practicing what to do in the event that there is a person with a gun or with some type of dangerous implement on campus there to do harm to someone. And so you can see in some teachers how this just really creates a lot of anxiety, a lot of distress, um, and, and very easily creates some dysregulation in that teacher's uh, neurobiology. Um, yelling. Um, and I'll go ahead and pull up these other two uh, as well. Yelling, uh, confrontations with students and parents 
uh, other school staff, administrators, and then even health and wellness lessons. Um, here in the United States, again, we, we have lessons every year. And in the past, in the, maybe in the distance past, uh, we would always have nurses come in from the district and they would come in and they would teach some of these different health and wellness lessons. Um, and those health and wellness lessons includes things about child abuse. And it includes things like, um, you know, there's a newer one even that talks about what human trafficking is. And these are health and wellness lessons that are, that are presented to the students. Um, they're usually developmentally appropriate, but at the same time, they are covering topics that can be very uh, triggering, very um, uh, cause a lot of sensitivity, neurosensitivity to uh, not only the students, but also to, to teachers, um, because teachers are the ones that are starting to, to present this information to, to the students. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure that I don't have to give examples of, of yelling and, and sort of confrontation um, and how that could trigger um, or cause some distress in, in a teacher. Um, and, and again, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, the, the long-term effects of, of COVID and what the last you know, year and a half has, has been like um, and what it, what it results in for, uh, for students. But this has been a very interesting school year um, from the perspective of the students and just their, I, 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 I'm always hesitant to use the word attitude because we, we, we use the word attitude, like, oh, he's got a bad attitude. Um, but they're, they're not as committed, they're not as driven, they're not as even interested, and, and they are much more willing to be confrontational with teachers or with even with administration now than, than I even saw two years ago um, when, I was in the, when I was in the schools. So uh, again, a lot of these things can lead to, to significant triggers for teachers. So we have to remember that if we want teachers to help the students remain regulated because the teachers are the primary ones that are responsible for maintaining that trauma sensitive classroom that trauma sensitive school they're the ones that are there to sort of keep the temperature down so that the students remain regulated but in order for the teacher to be able to do that in order for the teacher to be able to help the students remain regulated the teacher has to remain regulated and so we need to think we need to start thinking about how do we help teachers um, sort of keep that, that their temperature down, their, their neuro, um, neurobiology calm so that they can make those sound decisions and just like the, the things that we want from the students. And so um, some of the things that we need to do for teachers are the same things that we need to do for, for students. And the first thing that I, I, I would propose is that we think about mental wellness. Um, Again, I'm kind of mentioning, talking about this as a proposal because there's not, there's very little information, very little research looking at, that looks at the, the, this on, about teachers. Um, the research so far has primarily focused on, on students. And so, um, so we really need more research uh, on, on how it affects teachers. Um, but what we know about regulation uh, and dysregulation is we can say that we need to really create an environment that fosters um, healthy um, and healthy mental wellness um, and helps to, to build the teacher's um, uh, mental health. And so we could do that through offering on-site mental health support, for example. Um, there's, a, there's school districts that I know of that are um, implementing a, uh, where the, the entire district, students and teachers alike, have access to telemedicine so that they can, anytime that a teacher or a student is becoming distressed or they're having any type of issue, they can, um, they can make a call um, or, or log in online and they can have a teletherapy session with somebody to, to help them, you know, sort of maintain their, um, maintain their, their calmness and to, re-regulate if they've become dis dysregulated. Um, many schools and many setting districts have uh, something called EAP, the Employee Assistance Programs. Um, and what the EAPs often will do is they will offer um, free therapy up to, to like 10 sessions uh, for, for employees. Um, so they can schedule it on their own as outside of the, the work hours, but they can, they can 
choose a, a therapist that takes their uh, EAP and they can go for free sessions to, um, to help work on their emotional wellness. And then of course, the supportive environment, you know, the, um, across the different uh, schools that I've worked in uh, over the years, you can definitely see the significant difference between those schools where the administration has developed a, a really supportive environment where the teachers feel safe and secure, where they can come and, and they can bring concerns or issues to, uh, to, the, um, to the principal. Um, but then you also have those um, other schools that aren't quite as supportive and you, you see a lot, of, a lot of turnover where teachers are leaving and teachers um, you know, are, are quitting that schools, those schools to go to other schools. Um, so that, that importance of that supportive uh, environment just like it's important for the students, it's, it's similarly important for teachers. Um, something I like to, I just refer to as mental health moments. Um, you know, we, we have some of these things in um, place for students, uh, but again, maybe we should have the, some of these same kinds of things for teachers. So um, one of the things that we implemented in one of, uh, one of my schools is uh, for students, they have uh, in each room of the building, uh, they have a, a calm down area. So it's just an area off to the side of the, in the classroom that has sort of some, some stress balls. It has, um, you know, sort of a, a flip chart of different relaxation techniques of deep breathing or um, sort of visualization uh, strategies and things like that. But th the students can go to these timeout areas if they feel themselves getting frustrated or overwhelmed and they can go there to um, sort of calm themselves. And perhaps we should have something like that in place for teachers as well. Um, so that teachers can go to some place where they can be by themselves for a few moments, not obviously not for a long period of time because they have uh, their work to do, but they have times you know, where they can go for a few minutes to, to de-stress and to calm down. Um, walking paths are also helpful because we know that th there's a massive benefit to being outdoors. Um, now, obviously when it's raining and things like that, you can't always be outdoors, but um, you know, it's like green therapy, just being outdoors in the greenery, in the, in the natural air, um, has been shown to have significant uh, positive effects on our mental health and to help calm us down pretty quickly and, and in, in um, healthy ways. And then um, I, I have here the example of a, a, there's a school district in Virginia who it, just this coming week, uh, so the week of uh, November 1st, um, they're basically giving their teachers because they recognize how stressed their teachers are, how overwhelmed they are from everything that's been going on uh, this school year so far. They're giving them basically giving them the entire week off. Um, they're uh, they're giving them Monday Monday and Wednesday I think are considered mental health days. Um, Tuesday they're giving them off because there, there's a I think it's a, a, a Buddhist holiday, but they're going to give them that holiday off and then. Uh, Thursday is another um, holiday or, or um, another special day. So they're having that day off. And then Friday, they're just used, letting the teachers, they will have to come to the school, but there's no students there. And so they're just doing um, parent uh, conferences uh, with phone calls and things like that. So in essence, they have, they're giving them an entire week off to, to take care of their mental health and to um, manage some of the stress that they've been experiencing so far this year. Um, and then finally, the, this idea of, the, of a nurturing environment. And I, I firmly believe that a nurturing environment begins from the top down. Um, and it, so it begins with the administration. Healthy schools have healthy administration. Um, that admin team has to be focused on providing that nurturing environment, providing that, um, that place where students and teachers feel safe so that they can, um, you know, they have those open door policies where teachers can come in and, and talk to someone, uh, talk to the principal or the assistant principal um, to be able to go in and, and share what, what's go going on, what's causing them distress, and so that they have that sense of a safe and supportive um, environment um, for them to manage some of the things that are going on and some of the, the, the challenges that they're having in their classrooms. Um, you know, Classrooms can be, again, if you're not in the classroom, um, 
you, you may be uh, surprised a little bit as to what happens in classrooms sometimes. You know, so often we, we sort of have this expectation that teachers always have complete control of everything that happens in their, in their, in their classroom, and, and typically they do. Um, but if you throw in a couple of students that, are, that who themselves become, can become dysregulated, um, or they, they haven't yet become socialized, suddenly you're in this, um, in this sort of stew of, of stress and, and frustration and feeling overwhelmed that, again, can influence the teacher. And so having a, having a good, healthy, and supportive uh, in nurturing environment uh, can be a great way to help prevent, uh, prevent problems and prevent issues. Um, the last... Uh, strategy perhaps to consider in, in helping teachers build their resilience and build their um, um, understanding uh, and to maintain their regulation is to increase awareness of this. Um, there are, again, we have all of this social emotional learning for students. Uh, perhaps we need to do the same thing for teachers. Uh, a lot of teachers, even though they, they are teaching some of these things to students, they're not necessarily reflecting it back to themselves. And so we need to have some direct instruction for teachers on how to uh, practice good, healthy uh, self-care. Um, you know, to have teachers in, in teams of, uh, uh, for, well, of peers, not necessarily just with their administration, but also with, with amongst themselves so that they can, you know, if they know that they're struggling with something or if they're experiencing something, that there's a a team member, you know, right down the hall, or another teacher who may can uh, commiserate on what's happening uh, in the classroom, so that they can talk to and they can get some encouragement and some support from them. Um, and again, some social emotional learning uh, directly towards the for the teachers. Um, we, we do a we're doing a better job at this with students, but we really need to make sure that we're focusing on this for teachers as well. Um, uh, very often, uh, we find that uh, adults struggle and become dysregulated, um, but they have no idea that that's what's happening. Um, we see this, of course, with, with folks who suffer from PTSD or from different uh, acute stress disorders. Um, they experience this dysregulation, these difficulties, but they don't connect it. They don't recognize that I'm feeling this way because of this. And since this is the trigger, these are some things that I can do to, to address that problem. They don't necessarily make those connections on their own uh, because again, they don't have full access to that cortical region of their brain when they're really stressed like that. And so increasing social emotional learning for teachers is, is a critical component of all of this. So, you know, remember the rule, um, you know, if we want to help the student, we have to help the teacher. The teacher is the one that's responsible um, for, for doing much of the, the trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive uh, learning and education that we have for students. Um, but for the teacher to be able to do that, the teacher has to be stable and secure and have that sense of safety. Um, they have to have that first. And so just as they tell us on, on flights, you know, put, the, put your oxygen mask on first uh, before you put it on uh, someone else, you know, we need to do the same thing when it comes to social emotional learning for kids um, in, in, and teachers in the, in the classroom. And that is it. So um, I don't know if there were any questions or anything, um, but I'm happy to field any questions if there are any. Yes, um, thank you for that insightful talk, um, Dr. Wilkinson. And yes, we do have one question, but I'd rather um, have Afshin pose the question directly to you. So Afshin, if you could please unmute yourself and ask Dr. Wilkinson a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for such a brilliant uh, talk. Uh, I'm a counselor at the moment and I work with uh, parents of special needs. So there were some very useful points you made. And at this point, I'm thinking about the burnout. And, um, you know, uh, the, the model you were talking about is very much to do with DBT, the dialectic uh, therapy approach. And one of the factors, mindfulness, rather than teachers going on and talking to the bosses, um, it might be challenging being 
being a teacher myself uh, because that kind of safety secure environment whether your information you share with your seniors is confidential or not i think everybody worries about that right i mean you don't want to be labeled as um as different or somebody having a mental breakdown but what about mindfulness is this something which you think is going to be a good idea to be introduced in schools uh, for for teachers and students alike uh, thanks for that question that, that that's a fantastic point and um and, and yes it is it is very important and there, there's been some really good research that has looked at again primarily about with students but has really uh, highlighted the um the profound efficacy uh, of implementing a, a school-wide mindfulness um, approach. Um, some of the ones that I really like, and I, uh, if, if I'm honest, I have tried to implement at some of my schools, but I, again, you've got to think about that top-down system, um, is th are things like, you know, you have a, a periodic um, a chime that, that, that um, rings throughout the course of the day sort of randomly, and whenever it does, um, everybody in the school just kind of stops and takes a couple of deep breaths and thinks about where they are. Um, you know, teachers can implement that in the classroom by them, you know, in, in their individual classrooms, just to teach the students and, and certainly encourage the teachers to take that mindfulness approach, to take some deep breaths, to regulate themselves. Um, and uh, again, the, the research has been really strong to suggest that doing those kinds of strategies um, significantly in decreases um, office referrals, disciplinary issues, um, increases um, academic engagement time. Um, yeah, those are really good, good strategies. So thanks for bringing that up. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Wilkinson. Thank you, Afshin. Do we have any more comments, insights, anything? I think we have one from... Um, Dave, um, would you like to say that yourself? Thank Good morning, everybody. Um, Professor Wilkinson, it's great to see you again. And thank you for kind of enlightening some of the more detailed um, breakdown of how ACEs impact and why reaction and responses are always going to have a different timeline. Um, reaction and responses is something that, that we we work with day in and day out in the world of psychology um, and it's something that I think the more of us understand how there is that difference um, and why there is that difference it helps us to explain it to those psychological awareness. One of the things that you picked up on was the support for the professional and it's something that APA has worked for, for the last three years at developing the program to do just that. We cannot have professionals not having the tools to be able to provide the support. We wouldn't send the military out to conflict without the right tools. We, you know, psycho psychological battle against vulnerability is something that we have to take the same, same approach. Professionals have to have the tools and accept that we don't all have those tools just because we have the letters after our name from, from our study. So thank you so much for, for kind of making that a, a point of your, your presentation. No, think, no problem. And, and you, you, are, you are so right that it is uh, very frequent that we just assume. Um, and, you know, I've, I've worked with administration and you know folks at the you know the main district offices and things like that we've had conversations about that assumption because I, I think it's um, I hate to use the word dangerous because it, it sort of implies a lot of other things but in that way it is dangerous to have that assumption that um, well we can just give the teachers that to do and the teachers will be able to present that information because you know we're going to give them the powerpoint to to show the students and so they, all they have to do is read the powerpoint um, meanwhile we're not really thinking about the content and what what it's done, doing to the teachers and this teacher may be a fantastic you know reading teacher um, but when it comes to some of this other stuff, she just may not have the skills it, because she's never been taught the skills. There's, there's no pre-service course on some of these things. 
And so uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, it is so important that we that we consider those those issues and that we um, you know let the give the teachers those skills that they need um, to be able to manage that. So yes, 